Inflation continues to be one of the key topics in markets, and the eurozone has seen its highest inflation since its creation almost two decades ago. But is this affecting everyone equally? And what does this mean for the European Central Bank and its monetary policy? Joining me today to shed some light on inflation in the eurozone is Simon French, chief economist at Pamir Gordon. Simon, welcome. Let's get straight into it. Eurozone consumer price index at 5.1% in January. Were you expecting this? Well, Daniela, it's a pleasure to join you. Yes, we were expecting it. The energy price backdrop in Europe, indeed around the world, is consistent with inflation well above both the ECB and indeed all central bank targets. And that's going to remain the case for, I would expect, the entirety of 2022 and quite possibly into the first part of 2023. The question, of course, is the degree to which uh, central banks around the world are particularly well equipped to deal with what at the moment, within that 5.1%, is a 24% year-on-year increase in the energy component part, which is really doing all the heavy lifting. Monetary policy, interest rates, QE, not a great tool to try and lean back in against that. Yeah, we'll get into uh, the ECB and monetary policy in just a second. But as you were saying, fuel costs, energy right, energy bills, food prices, they're all on the rise. How is this affecting consumers? Well, you're right to say that an increase in energy costs of the aggregate is a transmission in power and economic surplus from households to producers. The problem specifically in the Eurozone, uh, across Europe, is that the block is a energy importer. So actually the transfer is from Eurozone households and indeed businesses who pay these energy costs to largely external uh, energy suppliers, both in the United States, uh, in the Middle East, around the world, obviously in Russia. And there are real challenges because from an economic standpoint, and this is something that the ECB, other uh, economists across Europe have flagged, is that it is actually medium term a deflationary force by taking away household spending power and therefore a really delicate challenge for managing the macro economy at a time when near term it's inflationary, but medium term it's likely to be deflationary across Europe. Yeah, and it's not only the consumer price index. I mean, producer prices are also very high. Factory gate prices above 20%. Are we seeing consume, Are we seeing producers a little bit reluctant to pass on these prices to consumers because they potentially don't want to be seen as the bad guys here charging those higher prices to consumers? What's going to happen with their profit margin? Are we going to see erosion here? How are, how are producers holding up? Yeah, so that's a really good question. You're right to cite the German producer price index running at about 24% year on year is symptomatic of what we're seeing across the Eurozone. And the difficulty for, this is not unique to this cycle, but in all cycles, when you see a temporary spike or what you assume will be a temporary spike in commodity input prices, do you pass it on to end consumers? One thing I would say is thus far during the pandemic recovery is because of the health of household balance sheets, most producers have been able to pass on some, if not all, of those increases. And this is in contrast to previous periods over the last decade when producers have been more reluctant to do it. But it is the scale that I think is the real heart of the question, the scale of the price increases that some producers are being asked or considering passing through to consumers are unlikely to be readily absorbed and therefore there will be a risk sharing going on which will squeeze corporate margins but there will be some contributions from uh, European households who of course had their household incomes protected quite extensively throughout the pandemic. I think One of the issues also of the Eurozone is just got so many small moving parts, which potentially other economies and other central banks don't have to deal with. Let's take a look quickly at some of the data because January inflation for Spain, 6.2%, Italy, 5.3%, France, 3.3%, Germany, 5.1%, Lithuania, 12.2%. So there's a big disparity here in how inflation is affecting each country and its consumers ultimately, which is the key goal here. How is the ECB going to deal with this? I mean, it, it's it's hard enough. The, the Eurozone has had issues dealing with inflation and undershooting inflation in the last decade or so. How is the ECB going to get a grip on this and, and favour everyone equally? 
Daniela, you speak to a systemic problem within the Eurozone, which is trying to make a single monetary policy for what remains quite a heterogeneous set of economies, who, of course, the pass through from energy commodity prices, the domestic output gaps, which, of course, should be the long term key driver. They're all very different. And of course, the we go back to the very foundation of the Eurozone. There was an expectation over time that you would see a greater homogeneity across economic areas so that single monetary policy would be less of an issue. It is always moments like this, when you have economic turbulence as a result of exogenous factors, that really shed a light on some of the trade-offs, and they are trade-offs, that you get from having a single monetary policy. There are upsides, but there are downsides when perhaps the policy prescription you would choose in a country like Lithuania, which you mentioned in terms of very high inflation rate, is set against some of the perhaps more northern European uh, economies where the inflation rate is currently and is expected to be somewhat lower. It's, it's a systemic problem with a monetary union, but ultimately the ECB governing council with its coalition of views has tended in recent times, and I think it will continue, to be cautious and gradual in terms of normalising or indeed stopping the stimulative stance of its monetary policy. Talking about being cautious and gradual, we had Christine Lagarde, the president of the ECB this week, commenting how they were going to wait for the right time to hike interest rates and they were going to do it, in fact, gradually and take their time. This is potentially a little bit of contrast of what we saw the previous ECB meeting where markets potentially got a little bit overexcited about what the messaging around that meeting was. So just trying to even out that balance. Are people, are the markets losing faith in, in the ECB's ability to actually tackle inflation? Are they just continuing to be accommodative until the market kind of corrects and sell? No, I don't think the market is losing faith in the ECB's ability to, to deal with inflation. Indeed, if you look over the last few weeks, the favoured uh, metric of the ECB for looking at medium term inflationary pressures to so the five year forward, five year swap, has actually declined from more than 2% to about 1.75%, suggesting that the, the market, such as it ever a pure read on expectations, thinks that there is far less of an inflationary problem across the Eurozone over a medium term view than perhaps some of the bond market signals around that key ECB meeting perhaps suggested, which certainly pointed to a couple of rate hikes at the back end of 2022. I think Christine Lagarde's most recent comments poured some cold water on that, pointed to the point I made earlier about uh, energy costs medium term being deflationary for the Eurozone. But also, I think the watchword here is both flexibility and indeed a second one, optionality, is as the data evolves through the summer, the ECB Governing Council don't want to block themselves into a corner where they've committed to nothing in Q4, or indeed committed to rate hikes in Q4. I think what they want to do is leave both on the table and try and avoid markets swinging too far in one direction. So there's a bit of management meeting to meeting, statement to statement. Let's focus now to finish off quickly on markets specifically. Let's talk about the euro, of course. Um, it's pretty strong recently, especially off the back of that meeting we were just talking about there, really gaining some ground against the dollar and the pound, which had been lacking in the last year or so we've seen that euro underperformance what are you expecting from the euro in the next few months are you expecting the ECB to pop it up a little bit I know a lot of the focus now is in the dollar and safe havens and what's going on in eastern Europe but what are you expecting from the euro in the next few weeks months with these meetings that are potentially creeping up on us so we still see a downside bias on the pan-european index so against the dollar probably slightly more of a downside against the cross, against the sterling, perhaps slightly less. But the divergence of policy paths between a Fed that is talking about six, seven rate hikes in 2022, Bank of England, market pricing, five rate hikes, and the ECB verging between zero and two hikes, that is quite a policy divergence, which you would imagine over the medium, not day to day, not week to week, but over the course of the question you're asking, you know, months, quarters, you would expect a weakening of the euro consistent with those divergent policy paths. Now, 
as each statement emerges, as perhaps you reach some extreme points, either to the downside or to the upside, and the, the ECB you know, send out their big guns to talk the market back, that's the trading opportunity. But actually over a longer term, as I say, a downside bias for me. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for all your wonderful insight. That was Simon French, Chief Economist at Panmure Gordon, giving us his insight on Eurozone inflation and what to expect from the euro in the next few months. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel.